What did we say that was actually interesting about public speaking last time? Great, it was obviously a very important <laughs> session. I'm really pleased. You're here to do the job. Yep, yep, you're there to do the job, honour the audience. Yeah. Yep. So yourself. let's take out this word honour. What were the things that you were supposed to honour? Yourself. Yep. The first thing, though, I think I said was to honour the task. Mm. If you're there to open in prayer, don't give a sermon about why opening in prayer is important. You're there to open. If you're there to propose a toast to the bride and groom, don't tell stories about how many car breakdowns you've had getting here in the rain. Huh? You're here to propose a toast to the bride and groom. So, honour your task. Do, what was it, what did you say? Do the job. Do what you're there to do. Uh, and uh, probably 80% of the time people will do that. Maybe even more. But the really tragic moments are those times when someone gets up and doesn't do what they were supposed to do. Or they do something really entirely different before they actually get around to it. And that's painful. Uh, unless, they're, you know, unless they're really important or interesting people. Mostly it's painful. So make sure you honour your job. Do what you have to do. Did you take notes last time, George? Remember what you did? Could you? You can probably keep me honest and make sure I cover the same points I did last time. The other thing I had was to honour your audience because they are here, they're the people who came, well, they might have paid money, or they might have come out of their way, they're here on a Sunday morning when it's cold, they've got out of bed, they've got here for a church service, they are very important people, you've got to honour the people. And so they didn't come here for you to do some kind of ego trip, they didn't come here to see you shrink away going, um, 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 you know, they came here for something else than that. Honour them. Give them what they came for. And so, honour honor your job. Honour the audience. Uh, and I think the other one I would have said then is honour yourself. Make sure. But you know, I did, in honouring the job, I think, sort of honour your topic. You know, actually cover your topic. Do, do, it, do, it, do it properly. Um, there is a, a problem where, where someone will stand up and they'll say, well, I'm here to talk about... Um, how we can serve the Lord more effectively. And then they dribble on about all sorts of stuff and they never got to how you can serve the Lord more effectively at all. You think, well, we'll change the title or do something else. You know, you, you, you got us here on false pretenses uh, or you didn't deliver what you said. Uh, one of the classic jokes, of course, is that the, the minister sort of takes off his watch and puts it on, on, on the pulpit. They, people don't do it now because they've got clocks and other things, but it used to always be that the minister would take off his, clock, his watch and put it there to kind of keep an eye on his time. And uh, the joke goes that uh, two boys were going to school one day and, and one of them went to a Catholic church and one of them went to a, uh, an evangelical church and uh, they said, I'll go to your church this Sunday and, and you can explain what they do, what does it mean, and then you can come to my church next week and we'll explain, you can, I'll explain what it means. So the, the Protestant boy went to the Catholic church and he said, what does that mean? He said, oh, you're supposed to stand up now, or you're supposed to kneel, or, you know, or just be quiet. And, and coached him through you know, what all the different things meant. And then the next week he took the, the Catholic boy to the uh, Protestant church and he said, oh, no, you stand up now, oh, you do this. And at a certain point the minister stood there and he took off his watch and he put it on the platform like this. And the Catholic boy said, what does that mean? He said, it doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> He's going to ignore it just like he always does every week and preach for as long as he wants to. Putting his watch there didn't help at all. So as we get to this process of, of honouring the, the topic, honouring our task, honouring the people and honouring ourselves. Honouring ourselves means we don't look like an idiot. We, we want to be able to be respected and, and, and be respectable. And I think I told you last time about all the things that people can do wrong because they, they either focus too much attention on themselves, they're really absorbed with themselves. Well, the point is, they didn't ask you to open in prayer because you were important. They asked you to open in prayer so people could have their lunch. You know, like, opening in prayer is a step toward an outcome, you know? It's not about you, it's about lunch. And it's about opening in prayer or, or praying, saying grace or whatever so that the things can proceed. And so people get themselves all tripped up because they get excited about, about sideline issues when there's a, there's a certain process. I talked to you last time too about how the show, the show must go on. That's a, that's a terrible sort of saying in one sense, but it's so true. Um, there are processes that have to be completed and you have to actually focus on what you have to do to see it done. 
And the fact that you've got a problem or an issue's cropped up or that you've just got a horrible phone call from someone saying something's really awkward, you have to handle that really carefully in terms of honouring the job that has to be done, honouring the audience that's there. Right? Just make sure you do the right things. Uh, I remember being at Festival Hall here in Melbourne. There was a, a conference where people paid a lot of money to hear four of the world's major speakers. Uh, I was there with a video camera to, to make a video of some of the, the proceedings. Uh, I was able to get in early on, the, on the, the grounds that we were setting up our equipment. But there were technical problems. And as a result, standing out on the footpath on out of, outside Festival Hall there in North Melbourne, were hundreds and hundreds of people who paid a lot of money for something that's going to start at, at 9 o'clock, pre-registration at 8.30, and it was now 5 past 9, and they couldn't even get into the building, you know, and there was, a, there was a lot of, a lot of intensity there, a lot of bad feeling there. So when they all came in, the process was get them in their chairs as quickly as possible, get started as quickly as possible, right? Why? Because they paid a lot of money. These people are going to want their money back or something. We've got, to, we've got to make these guys happy. That audience at that point was the most important thing. Get the audience in, get them seated quickly, get the ushers working really, really fast, get everybody settled. And the person that was meant to speak first, they went to that person and said, we're we going not to put you first. We need a speaker who's very entertaining. And Alan Peace, if you know the name, Aussie guy that goes around the world speaking on, on body language, they got him up first because this was the hardest session to do right now. He had a crowd full of angry people and he had to be the first speaker. Now that's pretty hard, you know. They, often in entertainment, you will find that they'll send out some cheap act at first. They're not gonna bring out the, the billboard act if the audience hasn't been warmed up. I remember Tommy Steele, if you know that name, Tommy Steele, a, a singer from the, an entertainer from the 1960s. Um, Tommy Steele was asked how he learned his trade. He said that he, he lived near the, what it, what was the Bordville area in, in London, wherever that was, I don't, East End, whatever it's called. Uh, and uh, he wanted to be an entertainer. And so he got hired by some cheap place and he had to go out on the stage and warm the audience up. Hey everybody, did you hear the story about the what's ever? And they were going, boo, hiss, we didn't pay money to hear you, we wanted to hear. And he had to, he had to warm the audience up. He said, you certainly learn your skills really the hard way when, when, when you have, when you have a, an, an uninterested audience. They don't want to see you and you've still got to be able to make them laugh and warm them up. And he finally he used all his jokes, everything he possibly could do and look at the side of the stage saying, can I get off the stage now? And they'd say, no, keep going. They're not warmed up yet. And they'd go, wow, what do you do? Like, that's, that's really challenging. Well, that was the challenge that Alan Peace had as he went out in front of these people. And so he, he had his own way of doing it, and he, he did a very, very, very good routine. But, but he said it was very interesting. One of the things that he had people do was an interesting trick. He had them all sitting there, and he said, now, he said, I want you to do an exercise for me. It's body language. I'm going to talk about it. I want you to do an exercise. In fact, can you get your hands free? Can you get your hands free right now? I want you to do this exercise for me right now. Book off your hand, off your lap. Okay, and we're just ready. Now, I want you to put your right hand out like that. Right? One hand out like that. Okay. Now. When I say go, I want you to turn around as fast as you can and shake hands with the person behind you. Go! <laughs> the person behind you. Go. <laughs> now, what happens is, if you turn around to the person behind you, what has the person behind you just done? They've turned around to the person behind them. And what has the person behind them done? They've just turned around to the person behind them. And so you had 5,000 people who all laughed, like our uncle just did. And suddenly he broke the tension, right? very clever. Just broke all of the tension and then got them relaxed. And he said, what was interesting, he said, when I first came in, you were all like this. And he said, I knew that that was bad body language. I knew that was bad body language, was angry, aggressive, bad body language. I needed you to unfold your arms. So what did I get you to do? I got you to do that. You can't do that and fold your arms at the same time. And then I got you to take physical action. You moved in your seat. You weren't sitting back, right? You actually had to move in your seat and when you did, something funny happened and you laughed and I broke this thing, okay? Neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, is not something I recommend. I think it's probably got all kinds of new age occultic things attached to it. But neuro-linguistic programming has an interesting insight that I think is worthwhile. They said, you can speak to your body by your actions. Don't know that's how they say it. That's my wording for it. 
You can instruct your body by your actions. This is how it works. If you were to sit there in the chair right now, try this for a minute. Sit back in your chair and fold your arms. Just try it if you like. Sit back. And then put your head back. Watch me, but with your head back. You stay in that position for five minutes. Your neck's going <laughs> to... <laughs> you stay in that position for five minutes and your body says, I only normally take this posture when I don't like what I'm looking at or I'm a bit suspicious. Oh. So it informs your mind, be suspicious, be untrusting, be disinterested. Huh? Your body actually, your body tells your insides what to do. But then move, forward, move your back and just lean a little bit forward, maybe put your hands on your, on your uh, and look. And that's the position you're taking if you're saying, is he going to get the goal? Is, is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? <laughs> and at that point, you're actually really interested. And so they're saying this, you're in a lecture somewhere, and the, the lecture is going on, and it's going on, and it's running on, and it's running on, and it's running on, and you're falling further and further and further asleep. If you sit back and take the natural posture which your body says is, I'm bored with this, you've only given yourself a second problem. First problem is the speaker. Your body language becomes the second problem. So what you do is lean forward, sit back there, and, and, and put yourself in the position that you would be in if you're really interested. And what, suddenly you actually understand what he's talking about. Because your body will inform your mind or your, your inner person how to respond. And so if the audience is really important, most people that are up front and dealing with crowds of people or dealing with anything kind of learn to do this sort of intuitively. But you just notice the crowd. You just notice. You notice whether they're looking like this, or you notice whether they're sort of just you know, looking like this. And you read the crowd. Because they are the people you have to serve. They are the people you're engaging. If you're up front, those people out there are really important. Don't think, oh, I'm important because I'm out front. Hey, hi, everybody. I, wish you, I bet you wish you were here, but I'm here. Ha, ha, ha. I beat you. Ha, ha, ha. It's, not, it's, it's not you. It's not about that. It's about you serving those people. Uh, you've got this job to do, you've got something you've got to do. But now read that group of people. What are they looking like? How are they behaving? What's their body language? And if, if someone's sort of slumped and, and like this, then you can generally get the, the feeling their 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 interest is low, their feelings are down. If someone's doing that, you say their interest is up, but they're interested in something that they're dreaming about. <laughs> Uh, and if their eyes are actually level with you, then oh, well, they're interested enough and they're paying some attention, right? Um, if they've kind of got that sort of arm over the, you know, if they've got any of those kind of backward sort of moving things, then their the body language says, "I'm waiting for you to deliver. Just, just, just show me what you've got. Show me that I should get interested. And when I'm interested, I'll relax and maybe sit upright, or I might even lean in, right? And if they're leaning in, you think, ah, I've got the, the palm of my hand, you know, I've got them here, you know. And so people. Uh, if you're going to deal with an audience, well, that's just, it's just part of the intuitive nature of dealing with a crowd of people. Who have you got? Where are they at? And, and, and then how, how do you mesh with that? Um, if you have an official announcement, it's really quite simple. Ladies and gentlemen, excuse me please, everybody, I do need your attention. I do need your attention. You need to know that as you leave the building today, that back door is going to be locked. There's been an accident in the street out there. It's, yes, that's right. No, but that's all right. No, doctors, you can sit down until all under control. Now, everything is under control. But you will have to leave by the side entrance. And that's just an announcement, okay? That's just an official announcement. And you can just basically play the authority voice. Speak loudly, speak clearly, speak succinctly, speak like, you'll have to listen to me whether you like it or not. That's a kind of authority in your voice. I know you don't want to hear this, but you must listen. This is important. You know, and then you just... You just communicate. But if you've actually got to get them to listen to you for the next 15 or 20 minutes, then it's a bit more tricky. You can't just play the authority voice. You've got to actually uh, say, uh, look at the crowd and maybe work with where they are. On that particular historic day, Zig Ziglar was probably the keynote speaker for that day. Now, he's dead now. He was a lovely man of God um, who was, went around the world speaking and, and influencing people. As a motivational speaker, not as a Christian speaker, as a motivational speaker. And, and they kept him to last on the day. He was the, the icing on top of the cake. He was very good. But uh, they put Alan Peace up first to break the icing. Everybody set it in. By the end of the day, everyone was very happy. Nobody wanted their money back. But that was a challenge to have to work with that crowd under those circumstances. So honouring your, your, your topic, 
honor your crowd, and in the process you'll actually be honoring yourself. You'll actually give, give yourself. So if something's gone wrong, something's not quite right, don't dishonor yourself by telling everybody what's gone wrong. You know, just, just make it work for them. And the other thing about it is that um, I'm trying to find words to say to them. For you, having this session with me right now, you haven't actually got a clue what I'm going to say. You hope it'll be as good as the last time we, we, we got together. You'll learn something, it'll be valuable. But you don't really know. So if I was to say to you, I actually had 10 really good points written on a piece of paper and it's beside the bed. How do you feel right now? Oh, we're going to miss out. Now, why, why would I say something stupid like that? Because all I'm doing is going to give you a bad feeling. If the truth is, what we're actually doing now is something that we'll do over and over again and it's going to continue to be fun and you are really going to enjoy actually doing the job. This is what we plan to do today. And so that's a much more upbeat message. I didn't leave a piece of paper at home, but I'm just saying, when you're up front, you control the atmosphere of, of, of people's expectations. So why not reward them with positive expectations? Now, I threatened you that I was actually going to get you to do something today, a workshop. So, I would like you all to do this, but I'm going to allow you not to, if you don't want to, because I know that some of you are going to be a bit embarrassed. But those that will participate will actually have the most fun. So, what we're going to do, we're going to practice the very simple task of walking to the podium, this is our podium, and saying, Good afternoon, friends. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's my great privilege to introduce and you name the next person that's coming up. And then, as they come up, you step back and applaud them because they've actually got to get to there. And once they're there, while you continue to clap, you can then leave. Because remember, you are leading the audience. So it goes like this. Good afternoon, late friends. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my great pleasure to be here. And it's my great privilege this afternoon to introduce to you Arunka. Let's welcome her as she comes. At which point, at which point Arunka jumps to her feet. Oh, good. And she comes up here. And I just keep applauding her because, you see, if I applaud her and I say, here's Arunka, and I stop, you probably will too. So I want you to continue applauding her until she's settled. So I will have to keep applauding her until she's settled. Only I can't let you know that I'm thinking, why is she taking so long? So I put a smile on my face instead. Good afternoon, friends. Um, now, wasn't that a bit fun? Actually, getting out and having a bit of a go. Um, it's interesting that um, the first time we do something, we always feel a little bit awkward. Somebody told me, uh, well, this, in preparing to be a public speaker, I took that very seriously. When I was in high school, I went into a competition run by the Lions Club, and the winner of the competition was taken to America as a prize. One of the boys in the next year ahead of me at school had gone to the national finals, so I went to him for coaching. I said, I want to go to America. I want to go to the national finals. And so, um, he, uh, he told me a whole lot of things that he'd observed. He said, it's amazing how that when you have to be a really professional speaker, they're going to put you on a stage in front of, of, of people around the world. You're representing Australia. So they're very fussy. You can't be... You know, that, that makes Australians look like that, right? And so they were very, very fussy about what, what you did, and they, they set very high standards. So he coached me on a whole lot of things. And he said that one of the things that, that, that he found helpful was that you think about the right way to do it, and you rehearse it. Now, rehearsing something. Rehearsing something like this. You're on the side of the stage in an ante room over here somewhere, and someone's at the podium, and they're about to introduce you, and you were going to walk across a great big stage maybe for 25 feet before you get to the center microphone. All that time you're walking, they're applauding and they're watching you and you don't want to trip over your shoelaces and you don't want to look silly. So he said to me, which foot do you lead off with, your left or your right? I don't know, it probably comes instinctively. He 
said, yes. But he said, if you rehearse it, it'll always be the right foot. So if you're standing here somewhere and you have to go to the right, which foot do you lead with? Well, maybe it'll work differently for you. But I thought to myself, I will be leading with my right foot. My left, sorry, my left foot. I'm going to go right. I would lead with my left foot. So uh, I could, in fact, have my right foot ready and just step out like that. Or I could have my left foot ready and step out like that. What difference would it make? Well, it depends how I walk. If walking with my left foot means I'm basically sort of turning two side onto the audience, I really should be able to walk and still be partly presented to the audience. That would be what you'd expect of someone coming on stage in, in a really professional setting. I'm talking about not just an average setting. So, even so, so I would lie in bed at night, imagining myself on the side of the stage, leading off. I was going to lead off with my left foot, but I, I imagined myself doing that, and I imagined all the time it would take for me to get to where I had to go, and I rehearsed it in my head, so that when the time came, it would be automatic. So, getting you up here to do this silly thing, which we'll do again next time we have it when we do a workshop, we'll just do it again, right? Different words, something a little different. But just so you can say, I've actually done it. I've actually done it. That's not so hard. I've actually done that. And then you do it again, you do it again. And in the end, it's like, ah, eh, I'll do that in my sleep. Eh, no big deal. But uh, someone like Zork is saying, I've never been up here before. You know, well, that's the first time. Now, it'll never be the first time again. She's done it. Yay! <laughs> and so then the next time round, it becomes easier and easier. And so I think there's a lot to be said or having fun like that, where we just get up and, and go through the process of introducing somebody and then trying different words. Um, what I will do, if, if you like, next time is actually have some words on the screen so you basically know exactly what you're meant to say and you can follow it off the screen and have a script so that you can be exact and precise about what you say. I used to find it really difficult as an MC in an event when someone had a really important title and you had to get it right because they were the his Excellency, some, something of the whatever the thing of the thing is like, it's you know, 14 words, and you just don't want to get it wrong, you know. Um, he is he's the Lord of the Dunhill. Oh, sorry, Lord Dunhill. <laughs> Lord, sorry. You know, you just there's some mistakes you can't make. You know, you just have to try and get it right, and so you you struggle over over. I used to find that very 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 distressing under those sort of super professional situations. Now, the other thing that I'm going to just quickly talk about before we run out of time is to actually choose to be personally confident. Choose to be, and I was moving up to this thought a minute ago. The people who stand in front of a crowd of 5,000 people and talk to them every day, how hard do you think they find that to be? Yeah, probably pretty, pretty ordinary, right? It's ordinary. To you, how would it feel? You know, <laughs> nerve-wracking. Okay. So, the audience, are they going to respect you if you come up and say, <laughs> you know, how are they going to feel? Right? So, what you have to do is to be able to say, if I've done this 5,000 times, if I've done it 5,000 times, how would I behave? That's how I'm going to behave. If I've done it 5,000 times before, how would I behave? That's how I'm going to behave. And so, you think a person's done it 5,000, if I was a politician, uh, and uh, the Prime Minister and I was walking up to the podium, I'd probably walk up, I, I, I'd, I'd be respectful, but I'd probably be perfectly happy to have my hands in my pocket. I'd probably be perfectly happy to button up my coat in front of everybody. I wouldn't be feeling like um, I have to be, I, I would be feeling quite confident in my, settled in myself. So despite the fact that I'm feeling like this on the inside, <laughs> I'm going to try on the outside and be myself. When I was in New Zealand, I had to take an inter-island flight from from Rotorua in the North Island down to Christchurch in the South Island. I'd only ever been on one plane flight before in my entire life, and that was from Sydney to Auckland. So I knew very little about flying. It was pretty exciting for me. It was a big deal. And this was the first time I was going to be in a small plane. Right? The other one from Australia was an intercontinental, what do you call it, plane. So I was now going to be in a small plane. I got to the Rotorua airport and I had this other pastor with me who was escorting me and Susan down to, to visit something in Christchurch. And I looked around and I thought, all of these travellers who fly there on this plane all the time feel really bored. They're reading a magazine, having a cup of coffee, chatting to some friends. It's like, eh, eh, no big deal. And I'm thinking, I'm going to go on a small plane. I'm going to go on a small plane. I'm going to go on a small plane. Wow, I've never been on a small plane before. Right. 
I thought, I don't want them to look at me and say, boy, that guy's never been on a plane before. I thought, I, I want to look cool. I want to look respectful. So I thought, how do those people react? I saw people strolling around. I saw them looking in the shops. I saw people chatting, reading a magazine, some snoozing on their suitcase. I saw that stuff. And I thought, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to walk around the airport as if I've done it a thousand times. I got up and I walked around the airport, made a big mural up on the wall. I looked at the mural for a while. I went and looked at the shop windows. I looked down at some of the airplanes, what activity there was. I wandered around. And I thought to myself, I'm practicing being cool. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be excited. I'm not going to be nervous. I'm practicing being cool. I just, just for the, the exercise of it. I sat back down again near Susan. And the other pastor said, said, oh, you've flown lots of times, have you? <laughs> I said, uh, no, this is actually my second flight. Out. Said, oh. He said, you look so comfortable. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled it off. I looked the part, you know. I thought something about that when you're, when you're up front and when you've got a job to do. Um, nerves and things can actually be fun. It can be really sweet to see someone get up and be nervous. And, and, I mean, it's not, like, it's not like a curse. But I'm just saying that it's also really wonderful when you can actually practice being in control. And that comes back to what I said about NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, a little while ago. If I, if I walked around the airport thinking, oh dear, it's the first time I've ever done this, and, what is my body telling my mind? It's telling my mind, you're worried and you should be. You're uncomfortable and you should be. This is scary and you should be scared. Right? But if I stand up and take a deep breath and just go for a stroll, my mind is saying, you don't know what you're in for. My body's saying, it's perfectly fine. My mind says, you, don't, you, know, you should be afraid. My body's saying, no, let's just cruise. And so I help to neutralize those internal feelings of being uncomfortable because I've taken a body language posture of being comfortable. And so for you, there might be different things that help you feel comfortable. And you might find yourself coming to, up to a podium. One of the worst things that you can probably do is to be nervous. I'm so nervous. You know, I've got to make this announcement. I've got to make this announcement. They're going to call my name any minute. They'll call my name. Okay, I've got to make this announcement. The doors are locked. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> that was pretty dramatic. <laughs> and sometimes we can be so geared about what we have to do that it's almost like, let's get out of the numbers, we're going to sit down. <coughs> we're going to sing a first hymn, and twice as fast. <laughs> and just, just to get it done. Huh? And so what you might have to do, even though you're feeling nervous, and you're going to say, to I'm actually going to let myself, I'm waiting to be called up. Deep breath, deep breath helps the settle down. I'm going to walk up, I'm going to lift my left foot up onto that step, not my right, because my right is sort of complicated. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, so I'm, just, I'm actually just going to step up like this. I've got the, I'm pretty on short, I know what I'm going to do physically, I'm under control here, okay? Foot up, next foot, two more paces, I stand here. Look at the crowd, one more breath. They're not in a hurry, they can wait long enough for one breath. And then I can do my own. Friends, just let me bring your attention. Da -da 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 And then I can walk up like this. So just control your body and it will help you pace down all of the things that you have to do. Nerves and tension tend to make us do a couple of things, speed up. And also I told you about last week, the last time about the constriction of our vocal cords. When we're tense, when you tighten something up, it actually begins to sound like it's tightened up. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Oh, I, was going to, I, was, I, was going to, I was going to tell you that. Um, excuse me. Uh, you better get a glass of water. And everything on the inside has kind of just been, you know, so tightened up. But if you can get up there and go, everything opens back up again. The vocal cords open back up again. And then when you talk, you're actually talking at your normal voice speech instead of, I was going to. Excuse me. I was. Because you know, sort of, it always gets a bit high pitched when you when you tighten it up. When, when I was uh, uh, one of the singing lessons that I had about hitting high notes, that often people think the, the music goes da 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 da. That's a huge gap in that high note, and I'm scared of it because I'm scared of that note. And the closer I get to it, the tighter and tighter I get. And now I'm going to try and hit that note. 
you know, it's sort of it's a psychological process of just watching the music thing. Dum 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 dum. Oh, those high notes are going to kill me. So what what happens is you have to actually prepare and train yourself to be able to hit that note. And there's certain parts of your body that you do tighten up in order to support that note. But then as soon as you hit it, the, the next lesson is to just let everything relax immediately. He did it for half a second. Let everything relax. So that it can just go back to normal again. So you go, ah, ah. And you, you, let the, you let your body immediately relax again. Because if you don't, you go, ah, and ah, ah. I'm still tired. I'm still constricted. I'm still strained, my body. And you can hear it coming out and everything I do. So you have to be able to let that go. Even if, you hit, even if something is hard and, you, and you, you try to do it professionally and you get that point, but when you do it, you then try and hit that relax button. Let up all the steam, and go back to neutral again. So you might well have to come on up and just take a moment and all, everything's, all the pressure's gone. And then you say, we are going to have a Bible reading this morning and it's from Isaiah chapter 43. Would you open your Bibles to page will be 472, you know, but you've just brought yourself down to, to, to a, a stable level where you can operate at that level. So listen, listen for that tension. You will be tense, you'll be nervous. I get nervous, I get nervous. The more professional it is, the more demand there is, the more nervous I get. And nerves, they say, are good for you. But I have to control them by, by relaxing. And then when I do that, uh, uh, take that posture of relaxation something inside me says, oh, okay, good, we can, we can chill, we can relax. Not, not so much great pressure. But if I take a position of, of, of tightness, tight in my shoulders, tight, tight uh, in my, my throat, and then every, I try to act that way, I try to respond that way, then everything I do. But sportsmen learn that too. No matter how tense the game is, their body's got to be ready to go whichever way it has to go. And they, have to, they have to have a certain kind of heightened sense of expectation that somehow have all of that looseness as well. And so professionally, as we get up to, to, to do things, if you, if you are really struggling with lots and lots of nerves, then just, just find that moment to just relax everything, just relax everything, and then take on your task. Hey, we've done our time, but I hope some of that's been a bit helpful. We've reviewed what we've, we've done, and when we do get together next time with a few other people coming in as well, we'll do more of this, just get up and try some things. We'll get you coming up really fast in a big circle, you know, coming through nice and fast, making a quick announcement, sitting back down again, making another quick announcement, so that you get this sense of, yes, that's pretty simple. You get up to the podium, you simply speak your piece, and you step out of the way. But even remembering, keeping the clap, clapping the person that's coming up, just remembering some of the niceties and things that we talked about last time, about how you direct people's attention. Do you recall, quickly, uh, President Bush, Jr., the younger of us, George, Jr., whatever it was, and giving a speech, and there was a boy beside him about the age of 10, round-faced boy who yawned in the middle of his speech. Do you remember that? Mm. There he is talking away with this great big crowd of people and this boy standing there going, like that. Well, it was just like everyone in the America picked that up, you know, because it was like big, almost like a mockery of, of the prime, of, of their president. Um, he was, the boy was actually in view. He was part of the entourage. He was called up because he did something or other and deserved to be acknowledged and the president was showing how good he was by being able to give place for this boy. But the boy damaged the image of the president, basically insulted the president by standing there and yawning for the entire world to see while the president was giving a speech. So all of these things are part of, of, of the presentation, not just what you were doing, but if you're actually in view at all, remember you're directing people. That's why if someone's coming up, um, you know, Arunka's going to come up and speak. Thanks, Arunka. Meanwhile, while she's coming up, I get out my phone and start looking at text messages. I mean, I've just insulted her. I basically said, um, you know, it's up to her now. It's her job, and, and I don't care about you. I really care about this. You see? And that's just so rude. Just so rude. We have to be really careful. Arunka's coming up. Let's welcome her. And so I'm now going to watch her come. I'm going to keep applauding her because she's important, and I'm going to stand back until she's ready. Once she's there and your attention's on her, you won't notice that I slip away from my seat. Because it's not about me, right? I've handed the ball over to her. Just those professional niceties about being able to do things. I talked about if it's on the screen, say, let's look at the screen, or, or, or as it says, and you draw a pay attention to where it is. And I told you last time, there are people that are like a church here with a screen at the back, and they'll say, well, 
As it says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, and people are looking at the screen and the preacher's pointing over their head like, duh. You know, I've seen people do it. You think like, excuse me, has it not crossed your mind that the audience is not you? The audience, you know, this is a person who's so absorbed with himself and what they're doing, they forgot that the audience is actually, they're serving an audience. They're serving their sermon or something. They're not actually serving the audience. So the audience is looking there. Uh, so many more things that we could talk about, but that'll do for now. Hey? Father, thank you for the privilege of just um, toying over these interesting thoughts about how to be uh, comfortable and prepared and ready to serve you whenever we're given the opportunity to say something and to lead other people. May we be good at blessing people. And may we be comfortable and confident. May you take our talents and enlarge them so that they can be used effectively for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.